and good evening on a sunny July evening from Edinburgh. I'm David Codling from the British Council. And welcome to the third discussion in the Against Disappearance series, which is on the relationship between heritage and contemporary cultural practice. This series was devised in collaboration between Schubach, our partner Schubach, and the British Council's Cultural Protection Fund, a cultural protection fund financed by the British government's Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport. And we're honored that this event, this third event, is presented in partnership with the British Museum. Uh, note please that there is a British Sign Language interpretation and guidance about that will appear on the screen where to find it. And there will also be guidance on the screen about the hashtags to use on social media. Now, there's quite a lot to get through. Today, we're focusing on hidden presences, hidden histories, and how memories and evidence from different periods are still present, even if hidden or damaged, in the here and now, in different places. We'll be ranging across Cairo, Istanbul, Lahore, and Basra, among other cities. Later in this session, Joe Glanville will be chairing a discussion with three artists, researchers, curators. The Cairo Kit Kat Club is celebrated in the Shubak Festival this year. There'll be more on that later. And Adam Hafiz from Haraka Platform will be joining Rashad Shalim. I'll tell you a little bit more about his recent project in Basra in a moment. And Hera Buyuk Tasjian uh, to discuss the themes of hidden presences. Um, you will be seeing a couple of films reflecting on the city of Basra before that discussion. And before that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Manisha Porter from the British Museum to describe the fascinating exhibition, Reflections at the British Museum, which features Herabuyuk Tasjian's work in it. Over to you, Venetia. Thank you so much, uh, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the British Museum has worked with Shabak since the very beginning, and it's been a real privilege and also great fun. Normally at this time, Eckhard and I would have had wonderful events going on in the Great Court and talks in the lecture theatre, but this year, of course, has been very different. Undeterred by the pandemic, Shabak has managed to offer a rich programme these past weeks, and we are absolutely thrilled to be a part of this. It's a happy coincidence that the exhibition Reflections Contemporary Art from the Middle East and North Africa is open at the same time. It's up until the 15th of August. There's been a broad range of accompanying talks which have all been recorded and on the BM's YouTube channel, including Art Has No Country, like today, chaired by Joe Glanville. The exhibition consists entirely of works from the British Museum's collection. And among these works, I'm proud to say, are the extraordinary collage of Hera Buyuk Tasjian, Deconstructors, Volume 2. They're extraordinary because they are not only uh, intriguing and beautiful, but also because of their powerful underlying narrative that is so apposite to the theme of Against Disappearance. This is what I love about the works that we hold in the collection. By artists from Morocco to Iran, there is richness and depth to their narratives and things are not always what they seem. This also can be applied to the work of Rashad Salim, who I'm also proud to say is in the collection. It's now 15 years since we showed his Ein and Om tonalities in the exhibition Word into Art, a work that was conceived at the height of the destruction of the marshlands of Iraq in the 80s and 90s, and an issue that has been at the centre of his life and work um, for decades. Like all of you out there, I'm looking forward enormously to this panel, where we'll also hear from Adam Hafiz about his exciting Cairo project and much else. Thank you, friends and colleagues at Shabak, the British Council, and the British Museum for making this event happen. I will now hand over back to David. Thank you. Thank you, Venetia. Uh, it's an honor pleasure to be collaborating with British Museum as well as with Shubak on this on this series. Next this evening you'll be seeing two films one after the other straight on before we move to the discussion chaired by Joe Glanville and the first of the two films uh, Water is the protagonist. Both films are about 
Basra, the city of Basra in South Iraq, where the rivers Tigris and Euphrates meet. And um, the first of the projects will be, dis the first of the films will be describing the Safina project led by artist Rashad Salim, who you'll hear from a little later and who features in the, in the film itself. And this is exploring ancient techniques of Mesopotamian boat building and their relevance to Iraq today. And that project is in fact currently being presented at the current Venice Architecture Biennial. And then after that, immediately after that, we'll enjoy a conversation between Dr. Noura Al-Gailani and Tamara al Atia about the recovery of the Basra Museum, a museum in Basra and its importance for that city. That museum's resurgence is the fruit of a project in which Dr. Kahtan Al-Abid, Dr. John Curtis and Dr. Joan Porter McIver have all played an critical role from, from the outset. Both of those projects have been associated with the Cultural Pro Protection Fund, and that's something that we in the British Council are also immensely proud of. I'll leave you to enjoy those two films, and then we'll go to the discussion. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Basra city is known for its Shat al-Arab River, the meeting point for, of two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. This uh, Shat al-Arab and the two rivers forming identity for the city, but unfortunately, throughout a, hist a long history of wars, conflict and instability, and most recently corruption, this aspect has been neglected. Safina project comes in a perfect time this is a very important time for the city to revive its maritime heritage. And this is what Safina Project is doing. We are trying throughout the work that we are doing throughout uh, Safina Projects is to uh, reform uh, the city's maritime heritage by reviving it throughout different activities and programs. One of the most important programs is to record the building techniques of uh, old boats that were uh, the boats of Mesopotamia. Also in Safina projects, we are trying to revive the uh, sports of the related to the rivers and boats. Uh, and also Rashad Salim, the artist and the founder of uh, Safina projects, is reintroducing and rethinking the ark in the way that is putting the ark and the building of the ark in its right time, in its right place.
بالنسبه للفكره الاساسيه بين آه العراق بلد طبعا انهر ومياه فاحنا شفنا بين القوارب لعبت دور باهميه الزراعه لنشوء الحضارات لنخطط لنخطط لعمل متحف متحف للموروث الملاحي لتطوير كادر اللي يفتهمون ويقدرون يدرسون يطورون فهمنا للموروث الملاحي احنا ما عندنا مثلا اي قوارب تاريخيه في البلد مع العلم بان احنا مركز يعني مركز التجاره يعني النواة الطريق الـ 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 الاساسي للتجاره ما بين اسيا واوروبا وبين افريقيا والشرق الى اخره For Basra, I have noticed that when the museum is reopened again uh, after the lockdown, uh, for sure the number of visitors is less. However, I can see that school children, when uh, sorry, university students, uh, when they have their graduation ceremonies uh, and when they have to take, for example, their picture, graduation picture, mm -hmm. they would choose the Basra Museum as the place. And one day I asked one of them, why Basra Museum? He said, tell me what is another better place than Basra Museum to take my graduation picture at. So people are very happy to have such a place in their city. And tell us a lot about how the young generation is thinking about the history of their country, uh, how, how they cherish the, the history of their country. And I think this is because, uh, you know, the, the recent times uh, are not the best in all of Iraq. So we, we remind ourselves uh, of that, of the history of the country, as like a source of of strength, to uh, for for hope, to uh, to help the country to change and uh, to to make the change as as a new generation. Yeah, but it also uh, uh, brings us back to the Basra Museum because really the Basra Museum is not only about Basra. There are these fantastic three other galleries, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, and the Assyrians. And that I find fascinating that uh, you people want to have a, a, a mini Iraq museum, uh, a quarter Basra and three quarters the rest of the country. What, why, why would the Basra people want uh, representations of so far north as the Assyrians? Well, I think because first, all of us Iraqis are very proud of the different civilizations that took place in that country, uh, regardless of its ge geographical place. And the second thing, I think there is something about Basra that, you know, because um, in, in Basra, Shat al-Arab is the meeting point between two main rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. And because those rivers go down and through Iraq from the north into the south. Mm. So uh, Basra has a, a, like a sense of unity uh, mm. in it as, as a city. And to represent that in a way, in, in a place like a museum, I think it's very important to be, uh, uh, to have these different halls representing different civilization in different cities around, uh, around the country to, to be inclusive of those great civilizations this is uh, reflecting the, the, the unity, the sense of unity that the city has uh, because of the meeting. I think the meeting point of Tigris and Euphrates in Shat al-Arab in Basra gives that notion and the best ways to reflect that in, in a museum. And it is, it is the legacy of Basra. The rest of Iraq is part of its legacy. Um, and that brings me to a, a difficult question. 
part of the legacy is actually where the museum is the building complex that it is in and that is a very controversial or bittersweet part of Iraq's history um, tell me about these presidential palaces what's the background in that area well, uh, those palaces originally, they were only one palace that was built in the late 19th century, the, the Agha Jafar Palace. Um, and then at the 70s of the 20th century, it was uh, took over by uh, Ba'ath Party until the, after the Iraq and Iran war, where Saddam made a visit into this uh, complex and uh, he decided that he should have different palaces at this area. And each palace that was dedicated as, as gifted into one of the mm -hmm. previous uh, presidents of the Arab countries, like one to Hussein Barak, the other one to King uh, Hussein of Jordan. Um, but actually, uh, Saddam never visited those places again, or those palaces again. Uh, but when they, they established those palaces at this area, uh, they were, dedicated, they were uh, um, uh, housed to different uh, military forces, government, uh, uh, let's say, uh, figures at that time of, of uh, Saddam's regime. But after, uh, after the war in 2003, uh, the Allied uh, forces uh, took these palaces as their stations in Basra, in the city of Basra, until they, they left the city. And then, you know, automatically these palaces were uh, under the control of the uh, military and the government authorities until this moment. So uh, this area is actually, it can tell a lot about, it can tell a lot about the, what's, what's happening in that, uh, in that city throughout these different times and wars and different situations. Uh, so, but in 2016, because what happened in other parts of Iraq of the uh, ISIS invasion, uh, and because of the uh, creation of uh, the uh, popular mobilization forces, uh, some of these forces, they took, some of these palaces as their stations as well until the moment. Mm. So the place is still, um, you know, it's, it's not easy for Basra people uh, throughout, you know, the different history that was taking place in this uh, uh, quart, uh, this complex to visit the area until the museum was established there. So the, well, the establish of establishment museum was like the starting point of turning the, the whole concept of the, this area as a military based uh, 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 let's say, or military forces based into a place where people can actually visit cultural centers mm -hmm. and museums. And that mm -hmm. was the plan from the beginning, to have the, all of those palaces to uh, change them and to be established as museums and uh, cultural centers. And you know, we have uh, in discussion the, the plan for having the uh, Iraq's Modern History Museum at Al Jafar Palace, which is the, mm -hmm. the one that we talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, so yes, that it was challenging for people after the uh, establishment of the new museum 2014 to get inside this complex, especially that this complex has this uh, like uh, enormous gate uh, at the beginning of it, and that gate represents, uh, you know, uh, let's say, in in Saddam's time, mm. people have this fear, the terror they they felt uh, against that regime. And to overcome such terror, it was really a matter of challenge for us uh, to invite people to get inside this complex uh, to, to see the palaces, to, to visit the museum. But I think the, the main thing about that is the gate itself. Uh, in the same time, people also were curious what is inside there, what is behind this mm -hmm. gate. So it was uh, like some people have felt fear, uh, fearful, some people felt curious. That was a big challenge for Basra uh, Museum uh, to overcome. Uh. Hi everyone, I'm Jo Glanville. We're going to be coming back to Basra and Iraq a little later in our discussion when we talk to Rashad Salim about his really extraordinary project in Iraq. But I'd first like to introduce you to two artists who are joining us tonight from Turkey and from Egypt, who are going to talk a little bit about their work, and then we're going to have a discussion with Rashad Salim as well. So first, it's a very great pleasure to introduce you to Hira Buktashian. Hira was born in Istanbul, and in her multidisciplinary practice, 
She uses the notion of absence and invisibility. That's to anchor memory, space and time to unseen and forgotten aspects of history. And she does this through site-specific interventions, sculptures, drawings and films. She's participated in solo and group exhibitions within Turkey and internationally, including the Singapore Biennial and the Venice Biennale. And as you'll have heard Venetia saying at the beginning, her work's on show at the moment at the British Museum as part of the Reflections exhibition. Over to you, Hira. Thank you very much, Joe, for the introduction and to Venetia and David also. Um, I'm extremely pleased to be a part of this conversation today among great artists. And uh, before I begin, I would like to thank to um, the British Museum, um, the British Council, to Eckhart and the whole team of the Shubak Festival as well to invite and to host this uh, amazing event. Uh, the work that I'm going to present today is uh, a collab series titled Deconstructors Volume 2 that is currently on view uh, within the exhibition that Venetia beautifully uh, spoke about. Um, the selection in the show is a part of a larger body of collages that was produced in um, 2017 and was first exhibited in the Dhaka Art Summit um, as a part of the exhibition called Planetary Planning, uh, curated by Devika Singh. Um, Deconstructors is um, a photographic intervention uh, that retraces absence by excavating architectural memory uh, through particles that compose fluid lines and forms that activate the stillness of uh, places that carry the weight of history. And um, these collages specifically look into the aspect of um, the erasure of the architectural memory of India's Punjab uh, in relation to its contested and turbulent history from the colonial period up till the partition phase. Um, each piece explores the tension um, uh, of the presence and absence, um, the matter of being in between situation in hybrid spaces within different cities of Punjab. Um, within almost all the compositions, uh, you can see an unexpected source uh, that overfloods and interferes the current pace of time. Um, my relation to India's Punjab began through uh, this piece, which um, came to life with my first visit to Amritsar uh, on 2016, um, that actually led to an accommodating feeling of a sense of familiarity, something that uh, made me feel that I already know this place. I think uh, there's a sense of gravitation to certain places and instances that uh, offer a reflection of ourselves. And such impressions enable us to feel grounded through the remnants of these elements and places that are relatively unknown to us. Um, so in that sense, getting to know more about the history of the region uh, resonated with, within me in terms of um, certain historical narratives that repeat within my own geography uh, and the continuous transi transitions uh, within the history of Turkey over the minority communities. Um, and land politics, uh, specifically 19th century onwards. Um, one can see the repetitive pattern of displacement uh, that follows with a deep sense of absence that is left in the urban setting. And being in Amritsar and thinking of uh, the, uh, the Great Partition in 1947, uh, looking at all these waves of people who could not take their homes, but rather uh, preserved it in their own memory. I was often reminded of um, the Asia Minor catastrophe that happened in 1922 and more displacements that followed in the upcoming years until uh, the late 60s. Um, so in the following year, I decided to travel around different cities of the region, uh, such as Amritsar, Chandigarh, Patiala, and many others, um, in order to understand and document the pre- and post-partition traces and their reflections today uh, within uh, the urban context. Uh, and the white cubic labels you see um, on the collages that consist abstract forms um, actually came into being through uh, certain encounters and 
um, similar patterns I observed uh, during these travels between all these cities, um, such as um, the bullet marks uh, in Jalianwala Bag Memorial Park in Amritsar, uh, that were outlined with white dots in remembrance to the massacre that happened in 1922, um, as well as the marble slabs of the Golden Temple complex, and, and of course the typical uh, brick architecture of Punjab uh, that resonates with the constant cycle of making and undoing uh, almost. And looking at all these elements gave me the intention of an act of drawing or mapping that underlines the unnoticed and becomes a thread that anchors the interior to the one that is outside, as well as the invisible to the unseen. Um, looking at all these elements gave me um, also um, a sense of, um, you know, um, considering Punjab's relationship with water as the land of five rivers that uh, both heals, uh, but also made me think about the nature of water um, as a guide that knows how to draw and shape the land, as, as well as uh, finding its own cleft in, in a subtle way. So in these works, a sense of an unexpected wave or movement ties each image to one another, fluid of forms taking over and uh, moving between monuments buildings or leaking from a deserted window uh, that reminds itself with a gesture. To me, such form of drawing is like a method of unlearning by deconstructing certain fragments. And I guess mark making itself stands as a reactive response to our own memory um, that may connect us with the invisible landscapes that we recollect within our minds. Um, I think through all these aspects, um, these images, um, as well as the surface of the paper itself, becomes an embodiment for the silent existence of um, the ones that uh, once existed and is absent today, to be able to reconstruct itself. Thank you. Thank you, Hera. We'll be coming back to you shortly to talk to you more about your very evocative, powerful work. Um, and what I'd like to do now is to introduce Adham Hafez. Adham is a choreographer, composer, theorist and curator. He's the founder of Haraka Platform, and that's a collective dedicated to performance and choreography founded in Egypt more than 15 years ago. He's also the co-founder of Wizara, a unique blockchain-based platform that enables artists to experiment with technological tools and alternative economies. He studied for his master's in choreography at Amsterdam University of the Arts. He also holds a master's degree in political science from Sciences Po Paris, and he's currently completing his PhD in performance studies at New York University. And you'll be able to see the work that he's talking about today at Shabbat tomorrow. Adam, welcome, over to you. Thank you so much, Joe, for um, the wonderful introduction, and thank you, David and Venetia, for, for this great panel. Um, I'll jump right into it so that there's time for conversation a little bit after. <clears throat> so for some people, it is hard to imagine relics disappearing or historical buildings being demolished. And um, mostly, these are people that live in cities that have museum collections that seem to be resistant to the wear and tear of time and of political turmoil. Usually, cities that seem, on the outside at least, to be protected from crisis and wars. Or cities that have exported their crisis and wars elsewhere that have engaged with colonialism. Some of these cities have also built their collections through questionable methods of ethnography, things that a lot of museums today are busy with, rethinking what ethnography and cultural anthropology might mean in today's world. On the other hand, you have pioneering cities that are losing artifacts, cultural institutions, buildings, but also academics and artists today through a very complex set of dismantling artistic practices because there is a lot of power that resides in the arts. Artists scare regimes of power because of the power that resides within the arts, and this is a problem as old as time. 
This is also why oftentimes art has been used as a tool of foreign diplomacy or even as tools of intervention, if we think of the Cold War as an example. Or art is being oppressed and contained because of its very vibrant political core. We started working on this research on the history of the Kit Kat Club, which is a cabaret that existed in Cairo in the 19th and 20th centuries. Some even dated back to the late 1700s. We started working several years ago when we were researching the history of the Suez Canal for a project that was looking on the 150th anniversary of the canal. And we worked on that research between Cairo, London, Paris, and Berlin, looking for documents, stories, maps, and images. One place kept reappearing like a ghost from the past, and we were not sure if it existed, which is the Kit Kat Club in Cairo, which used to be a radical place that gathered politicians, economists, ministers, the way it gathered belly dancers, filmmakers, choreographers, and singers. A mythical place that no longer exists, where reality and fiction mixed all together. Did Josephine Baker perform there? We don't know for sure, but we have photos of her in downtown Cairo in the middle of the nightlife that used to exist. What brought Cecile Bay DeMille, the American pioneer filmmaker, at Cat in Cairo? And what sent Samia Gamal, the iconic Egyptian dancer, to New York's theaters and clubs? What fascinated us with the story of Kit Kat was how a place could hold so many opposites and tensions. The main belly dancer there, Hekmat Fahmi, becomes a favorite of Hitler's. Mussolini gets jealous, and then he asks for a private performance as well. The dancer's friend, whose name was Hans Hepler, becomes a double agent and involved in a story that some threads of it eventually make it um, to the film, The English Patient, which many of us have seen. And while the Kit Kat is no longer there, because as I said, it was demolished in the second half of the 20th century, we started doing a lot of our archival visits looking for shreds and remains. And in one of the visits, we met with the cinema critic and historian, Ashraf Tarib, who told us if you're looking for a place that no longer exists, you need to find the people that used to go to the place. And if you find them, you find the place. And this was a very important shift in our research methodology, but also in the dramaturgy of the work itself, of the performance the digital cabaret performance, which you will see tomorrow at, uh, at um, Trebek Festival. We premiered it last year during the full lockdown here in New York City. We started thinking of people and their relations and their stories and not of the history of a physical building that has been demolished. And then everyone came to us like friendly ghosts from the past, each telling their story. Samia Gamal, Anthony Eden, Anwar Sadat, and many others. We started thinking of what still continues to exist from alternative performance genres to visual arts, relics, and music traditions. While we were staging and reenacting a certain kind of intimacy and public conviviality, reenacting the 1920s during the 2020s confinement and lockdowns. We were interested to think beyond stardom and celebrity power, which made us wonder what gave this club its unique power, making it one of the most radical performance spaces in entertainment history in the region at the time. We started thinking of the density of the urban development that happened in downtown Cairo that created a metropolis, allowing for a different kind of anonymity that didn't exist before something that urbanist and researcher Adam Koharski pointed out during our research. Another reason was a new class of music production, cinema, dance, and theater pioneers that were all women entrepreneurs. People like Asya, Naima al Masriya, or Badia Masabni, among others. A new kind of commons was created and a new kind of commonality, and new technologies were invested in. 125 years ago, Egyptian cinema was born, and more than 150 years ago, the Opera House was opened. But these are stories that are written out of art history as we learn it today, because in the leading academies, 
whether in Europe or in the US, it is hard to find stories about pioneering non-Western and non-white people investing in such technologies when we think of early beginnings. But this new kind of commons and commonality and investment of technology made us think a lot on the complexity of the aesthetic references that a place like KitKat presented and the kind of technology and economic rupture that could be needed today to think of how we can protect the disappearing performance heritage. And from working on fiction, investigating KitKat, we started thinking of how to invest in the reality today. We started working with artificial intelligence and within the process of creating KitKat, we used it to reconstruct images fragments of images that we found in archives of the leading stars of the KitKat Club, turning them into videos of what they could have looked like today. We started investigating the blockchain as a site of both alternative economies, but also a place where artists could create a different augmented reality to virtual reality. And we established a new initiative called Wizardo, which is a unique blockchain-based platform that enables artists from the region of Asia Africa and the Arab world to investigate this new economic possibility beyond the constraints of the cultural funding as it is today. And while we think of the disappearing past and we find stories of these radical women pioneers and how they took the chances in experimenting with new forms, we invest more into these new technological tools now and thinking of the crazy future that the arts is witnessing in the middle of these ruptures that are both technological and aesthetic just as much as they are economic. I hope you all come tomorrow to see our performance playing at Shebek, and I encourage you also to check out um, the links of our platforms, both Haraka platform and Wazara, which will be posted in the chat here on the Zoom call. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Adham, for that really fascinating voyage around your, your wonderful work. We're now joined by Rashad Salim and Hera Bhaktashan as well. Um, we've got around 20 minutes to have a chat about their work. Um, you can put questions on chat. We'll have to forgive me if we don't get to them because we've got, as you can imagine, a huge ground, ground to cover with this wonderfully diverse group of artists. Um, and we're talking tonight about disappearance, against disappearance of culture and about cultural recovery. Rashad, I wanted to ask you first about the remarkable work that you're doing in Iraq. And it struck me, you're an artist. Artists very often want to smash the past. They're iconoclasts. They want to break with the new, with the old, I mean. Um, and I wondered how much your your involvement with with the revival and reinvention of Iraqi culture, how much is that to do, do you think, with the destruction that Iraq has experienced over so many decades? Oh, it has everything to do with the destruction. It's also the displacement of the rupture that we have between the uh, uh, people one of the minorities that we have, between the people of Iraq, as well as between the, the urban and the, the rural. Uh, there's a rupture with the waters. Uh, Hera had spoken about five rivers. I mean, the, these civilizations that established on these rivers, you know, all of these major, you know, the, whether the Indus, the Nile, you know, the, the Yangtze, the, you know, all of these, they established on rivers for a reason, because it's connecting, you know, and these, these are connected. Uh, what we have at the moment is uh, is uh, the sort of double thing that Hera, that uh, I think Adam also referred to, where you have these technologies of of connection, and the ease of travel, the ease of of migration, of 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 leaving, on the one hand this freedom, and on the other hand the reality of engagement within the land itself has been disrupted, and significantly disrupted in Iraq. I mean, there's no access in areas to the rivers. You had, you know, these rivers were alive with sails, with boats, with trade, with movement, with uh, engagement, with the products of the rural communities. And, uh, you know, when we speak about art, we're also speaking about, you know, it's, 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 it's a very subjective uh, subject, you know, in that, uh, you know, what is art? I and mean, if you look at uh, Gauguin, you know, he, he, say, he, he speaks about art being something that tells you about where you come from, where you are, and where you're going in his famous last painting. You know, so, I mean, art has to do with, with 
with the understanding of, of precisely that. Who are we? You know, where do we come from? Where are we going? And, uh, you know, as, as an artist, uh, for quite a while, since 82, exiled, well, not exiled, because it was uh, self, uh, I had, you know, nobody had exiled me. I, I'd left in 82, uh, seeing the sort of the, the way things were moving with Saddam and the wars, etc., and and also family recent. But for, for decades, we were abroad while Iraq was being destroyed and you had the sanctions, the wars, etc. And I think uh, uh, Venetia knows, I mean, Iraqi artists are very connected. We are engaged with it. We have a lot of artists working beautiful works that express the kind of sorrow, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, this, the expression of this dislocation. Uh, but it came to a point with me that, that you know, and I think it's, it's great, the title of, of this panel or this thing, that of presence. This, where is that presence, that real presence? Uh, Harry was speaking about going there and connecting with that place. This was for, you know, a hugely important thing for me. Uh, there was a, a sense of, of despair, a you know, deep despair about the situation, what's happening and this. Look so the opportunity of going and using art and the idea of, of, of actually, you know, we, we speak about conceptual art. What's conceptual art? You know, having a concept that you can then create the art around and engage with what's around you. So I did that with, with looking at the Ark of Noah and re, reinterpreting as something rational. How could it have been built at its time and place? And as soon as you ask that, you know, you find the way that you know, there's these subjective uh, uh, interpretations of it and the sort of Chinese whispers over the ages. You know, that ends up with uh, the most famous arc at the moment being that of, of the gospel, which is basically 17th century uh, building techniques, uh, boat building techniques, that had nothing to do with the time or place. So using that as a concept and using art to enter, you know, that, that gave me that opportunity of, of a real engagement and then opening it up, because you have to remember Iraq was a place of a no-go place. You know, I started going 20... Uh, 2013 and then 2016 started working in the field. Uh, the British Council still hadn't really established any, you know, they left. Everybody had left. So uh, it, 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 it was a, and still remains an amazing uh, experience. And that's why I call it sort of expeditionary. So art can be expeditionary. It can go yeah. out and explore these areas. Yes. Thank, thank you, Rashad. It, it certainly is expeditionary. And, and also, obviously, has incredible resonance, global resonance, given the sort of unique role of Iraq in, in the history of, of human civilization. And here, are, I'm, I'm, again, sort of culture can disappear through war, as has happened in Iraq, or through neglect, through censorship, even just through the brutality of fashion, art, art can disappear. And I'm wondering what you, you talk in your work about being exploring the traces of disappearance. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what it is that attracts you to that, to, 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 make, the, to make those paths to, to, to rediscover. I think um, uh, the, uh, the, there is all these questions that, I, that often intrigue me to get into such path because there are these questions that, for example, like, um, like how do we identify absence through a work or how, like um, how do we even identify absence or how do we embody, embody such spaces that have gone through all these absences there are these certain fragments that I think uh, I think also since from my childhood I feel that I have this pull towards something that has left its trace and enabled me to kind of follow up and try to make my own way out of that because not everything is visible to all of us I think out of all our narratives that we have been listening today you know not everything is accessible information wise as well and I think out of all those traces you also start to create your own path and you find your own reflection in that I think um, that's the best part. Otherwise, also, it's really open to consume those histories too, you know, because, uh, you know, there is all this information bombardment we go through when we also re uh, read for our own histories, uh, right? So I think um, there is all this information mountain that you try to kind of um, pull out your own uh, self out of a thread that you just see 
and then it becomes like an anchor, I suppose. I think all of our works that we have been listening, uh, I think all of us have that in common, I suppose. Yes, that's interesting. I, th I think you're probably probably right. At Ham, I, I was sort of very struck by how you describe the kit, this incredible club, this incredible Cairo nightlife. You you describe it as radical, and it really struck me how we often, in a, in the arrogance that we have by just being alive, we often think of the past as old fashioned or out of date. And I wonder, listening to you talk about the Kit, Club, Kit Kats Club, were they actually more radical than us? Were they actually more modern than we are? That's a great question, Joe. I, I mean, when I talk to people now and tell them that um, I'm interested in, in working with blockchain-based technologies, and they think I'm crazy. I remember all these women that were investing in radio when everybody thought it was crazy and they thought, what is this box and why am I sitting next to a box listening to a music concert? I should be in the theater. The same with cinema, when everyone was speaking about cinema in relation to theater and how it's going to become a mass produced and distributed um, genre of basically saying something we've always known, which is acting and performance. And when, when you think of these people that at the time took that leap and to invest in these new technologies and decided to create work that is truly revolutionary because the artistic references that you see, the very few remains and fragments that we find from KitKat are things that combine indigenous knowledge of performance and practices of performance together with foreign ones. And it was not something close to what we now look at, uh, at and when we, when we think of like cultural fusion and intercultural dialogue, it truly was not happening on that level, it, it was happening on the level of engagement that these people are people that live together. A place like Cairo was a cosmopolitan. You had people that came from everywhere. You have actors in Egyptian cinema and in theater and in dance and music history in a place like Cairo that you'd be surprised decades later when you discover that this man was actually not Egyptian, but he was Austrian, even though he spoke in perfect Egyptian and, and lived and performed within these worlds or that this other woman was Greek or was British. Um, there was no question on where you come from and what your background is, and performance was not done from this identity politics kind of perspective that we see now, where work becomes representative of your identity, and then everybody is in their little bubble or in their little ghetto. So they worked against that atomization, and they worked against this um, identity politics driven kind of practice, which I find extremely powerful because when you work together and you're not allowing a larger system to atomize you, you become a much stronger front, which is what happened with all of these pioneers when they were collectively there, be it Greek or, or, or Jewish or Muslim or British or Armenian, or nobody thought this way. They just thought that these are people that are part of the Cairo down So in a way, I find it much more radical than today, both in the sense of its politics but also thinking of the aesthetics and the kind of economies that were generated then that were truly revolutionary and that were led by these pioneering women specifically more than men. Yeah, it's an absolutely extraordinary moment in history that you've discovered and un uncovered. We've just got about five minutes left uh, to cover this territory, which is, which is going to be tricky. Um, Rashad, I'd just like to come back to you and I'm going to have to ask you to try and be as brief as you can in, in your answer. Um, I'm very interested again that you that you set out as an artist initially when you started this extraordinary project of cultural recovery. Um, that you you saw it initially as an artwork, yeah. and now you're reviving not just boat building but a whole a whole industry, a whole maritime culture. And I'm wondering if you still see that as an artwork. Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, the boats that, that we're building are viewed by the people who make them as artworks. Yeah, the, the prow, this very proud prow that you have, has no, no reason to be except presence. And, uh, you know, and they vary from one tribe to another, and, and you've got the master builders who do it. And it's described as an artwork by people like Wilfred Thesiger, who, who lived there for seven years. Uh, so, I mean, and uh, there's also... Uh, we haven't shown it, but uh, you know the the work of of the women 
in the in the embroidery that they do that we are also engaged with because there's that feminine principle that we're bringing in uh, which which defines the sort of the garden but you have over here an iconography that we can trace back to the obeyed and pre pre sumerian periods that is con continued in in the embroidery of the women now what I, I find interesting as well is that you know we have to really remember that we are now in a, a, in a period of climate change we're having uh, you know, the changes that are happening we have gone beyond the sort of the idea of nostalgia and i'd like to bring in the the word solastalgia which is uh, developing which is where where you are in a place nostalgia has to do with you leaving a place or time ending and you wanting to go to that time but what we are experiencing now is some nostalgia where, where you are alone you're you're alienated within what you should know you know, what did where, you call yeah. that? Sonostalgia. Sonostalgia. It's, it's a word I think that's very important for our time. And when I'm talking about, you know, the, the, the arc of the flood, and I'm also talking about now. What, what kind of technologies, what kind of art do we need now to be able to actually uh, give agency, not just to our voice, but to the people in the place in engaging with what is happening now. I mean, last time I was in, 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 in Basra just a week ago, we were hitting 60-something, you know, in the shade. Wow. You know, there, so, I mean, we are in a very, it's a very real state of, of, of rupture, of disruption. And uh, art, art plays a role in that. Uh, and I see the work that I'm doing Certainly, I come out with artworks, and the works themselves are artworks. The concept is an artwork, but uh, we want to give the agency of making, returning that agency of making that connects the, the, the ecology mm. with mm. the place. Because what we have now, you know, all the products that were created by the rural community that kept them uh, alive and that was part of everybody's lifestyle, for example, what you drank from, what you ate on, etc., has been overtaken by plastics. What you wear, plastics, everything, plastics. Iraq is an oil country. You know, uh, just understanding the process of how we got here, you know, that I think is has to do with art. And art is, is that medium wherein which you can have the the intersection of knowledge. Mm. And as you show that cult, how deeply culture goes. In, into a into a, into a civilization. J Thank you, Rashad. Just in the couple of minutes that we've got left, um, Hera and Adham, I'd just like you to think about somebody seeing your work for the first time. What what what's the one thing you'd like that audience or that individual to be thinking about when they see your work, or to take away with them when they see your work, Hera? I think um, I think something that that I think I really want the work to provoke something that is inside themselves rather than being able to read my work. You know, I think the work is more like a gesture that should create that heartbeat or like create like evoke that um, particle of memory in that person's mind. Because when you take that specific work to a different geography. Uh, that does not carry or have any information about you and the artwork. I think the material poetics is quite important in that, like what the material says to the audience. And I think that is something that um, I want. I think it's, there's this emotional uh, feeling that should kind of evoke something that is deep inside them, I suppose. And I think what's very interesting about your work is that what you were saying when you spoke, that you've, you know, you've traveled all the way from Turkey to the Punjab and you found these extraordinary connections around displacement and I'm sure that that will resonate with people who see your work in, 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 in the same way I suppose that the Punjab resonated with you. Yeah, exactly. What would you, what would you like the, the audience tomorrow seeing your, seeing your wonderful revival of the Kit Kat Club, what would you like them to take away with them? Well, several things. I'd, I'd like them to hope for um, um, a different kind of future where different kind of performance practices are possible, whether they're old revivals of things that used to exist or new genres that we're yet concocting in this world of ours that is becoming more and more digitally mediated. I, I'd like them to be so more curious. In general, I think we need to be more curious about each other and we need to, we need to have the 
the the humility to understand that there are epistemologies and and art histories outside of our own. It's very easy when you're born in one given story that you think it's the only story. And I think there is a danger in singular narratives and it is crucial to start thinking outside of them. And this takes a lot of curiosity and humility. And again, as you've shown in your work, how just phenomenally multicultural Egypt was, you know, a, a, a century ago, and how how exciting that is. We have run out of time. Um, it's been a complete privilege and completely fascinating to meet all of you. Thank you. And I hope that everyone watching today will look at the wonderful work that you're doing. I'm handing over now to Eckhart Tiemann, uh, who's the director of the Shabbat Festival. Hello and good evening. And I'm Eckhart Tiemann, I'm the artistic director of Shubak. And what a fantastic discussion and company we have had. I could certainly spend another hour just listening to these contributions. And um, one may ask why a festival of contemporary Arab culture looks back into heritage, looks back into the past and um, enters in these collaborations. And the very simple artist for me is that in all those years that I've worked in cultures, artists have gone back. Artists are uh, fascinated by the past, by uncovering truths, by uncovering hidden presences. Um, because the act of uncovering is an act of finding not just what you find, but also the gaps, the gaps in something that will never be completely be uh, made whole again. And it's that gap that is filled by artists with creativity, with imagination, with new ways of thinking, and at times case with new technology. And I think this is why these discussions and the artistic work is so fascinating for us as a festival and I hope for you as an audience. So thank you very, very much, Joe Glanville, for steering us through this very, very co complex thematic material and Sumaya for what is a difficult task of translating it into BSL language. Um, some of you may have had a couple of technical glitches. Um, we will send out a recording of, um, for everyone who has booked for this event so you can listen to it again if you experienced um, a, a, a difficulty in the recording. For me, just to remain is to say, if you're in London, yes, come to the British Museum, see uh, Hira Bukachian's work at the Reflections um, exhibition at the British Museum, still there until the middle of August. If you're in Venice, please go and visit the first Iraqi pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial um, to see Rashad Salim's work. And if you're Anywhere in the world, online, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you can experience the Cairo KitKat Club with Atam Hafez and all his collaborators of the Harak Haraka platform. Atam works very collaboratively and collectively with quite a range of artists. We have recorded this session. It will be available after the festival in due course on our website, alongside to the other Against Disappearance discussions that are there already. So please check in um, into those as well. So for me, it's now to say goodbye and thank you. And I hope you take part in as much as possible in Shabak between now and Saturday, our last day. Thank you.